After your hideous disfigurement, you are showing incredible courage by agreeing to finally show yourself in public. <sighs> Thanks. America has watched you grow up in television and in movies. Now, after your horrific ordeal, the very mention of your name makes children scream in terror. Ricky Coogan, <laughs> the world is waiting to hear your story. How often do hideous mutant freaks pop up in, in weird film? You know, I think, I think it really depends on your definition of cult. Um, we have a kind of a broad, a broad church, um, and so the films we, uh, we screen don't often have hideous mutant freaks, uh, maybe less than you'd expect. Um, so we screen films that are like uh, just basically out of circulation, um, that we, we, we kind of call them orphans, outcasts, and outliers. So they don't necessarily have to have a really obnoxious uh, cult element. Uh, but it sometimes helps. Usually, a cult film of whatever type has to have a certain degree of sincerity to its weirdness. I think that, you know, if if the the storytelling and the influences and the casting, you know, I think of all of this is is played pretty sincerely in terms of its dedication to making something far out and and legitimately edgy um then you know oftentimes it finds it finds its, its target recently we screened turkish star wars um a film that's become known as turkish star wars and one of uh, one of the number of things that uh, problems that you know obstacles that it faces is the fact that people love watching clips of it and kind of chuckling at the you know the kind of the daftness of it but they, they might not want to, and that's true of a lot of these Turkish remix exploitation films, but they don't necessarily kind of show up when somebody puts their money where their mouth is and puts out a DVD because they're, they're really just interested in the, in the clips. It's about how you present the film. No disrespect to anyone that's running bad film night, but I think quite often uh, that does a disservice to the films. I mean, some, a lot of the times these films are out of context, so if you screen them, they seem like, you know, like they're not in on the joke. Or, you know, uh, especially with a film like, again, Turkish Star Wars, it's a film made in a very compromised set of circumstances. Um, and uh, quite often it isn't on the joke. So, but if you show that out of context, it, it becomes a bit how, how bad supposedly Turkish filmmakers are. Mm. And um, that's just wrong. And so you don't necessarily need to beat people over the head with it, but you can say, you know, this is, this is the context of this film, this is how we're showing it. Tom and I had just come out of NYU um, when we first met the Butthole Surfers. And in fact, we started doing work with them at NYU. When we were still at NYU, we shot some concert films for them, and we um, we did some other short pieces. But uh, and Freak was originally written the, as a Butthole Surfers vehicle. Um, yeah. It was it was written with Gibby Haynes, who came and lived with us in Venice, California, for a month or so, slept on our floor, and wrote a very, I mean, it makes what we currently have seem like a Gidget movie. It was very, very over the top. It was kind of like a, you know, a Roger Corman uh, beach blanket horror movie uh, with music. And nobody was interested in that. But there were, there, there was kind of rumblings in the underground of this type of stuff at that time. Um, you had, you know, bands like the Butthole Surfers. You had, and Guar. Um, you had, uh, you know, filmmakers like Sam Raimi making the Evil Dead series, Peter Jackson making Bad Taste and other films of that nature, Meet the Feebles. So there, this stuff was pretty uh, niche. I mean, I think Raimi busted through that better than anyone, but it was really, you know, this was before Tim Burton, this was before South Park, you know, people like the Buttholes and Sam and other people doing work like that were people that we were, um, were within our community. <laughs> Thank you.
And it must be interesting that, that experience of showing some of these films to a, a larger audience than they're ever in, not intended for, but they ever achieved before. And I wondered if you'd had any kind of su- surprising reactions to particular titles. Yeah, well, I mean, I think probably the best example is Prime Wave, a film called Prime Wave by uh, a, a man called John Pease. Uh, it's a Canadian film, he's Canadian. Um, it came out in 1985, barely came out in 1985, which unfortunately is also the same year that the Sam Raimi film Crime Wave came out. Um, at the same time, John had had a bad kind of distribution deal signed. So after like, a kind of glorious you know, festival debut at the the uh, what, what would become uh, the Toronto International Film Festival, the film didn't get a proper rollout and subsequently it became hard to find. Um, it didn't get a proper release. It wasn't on DVD. I think it was briefly on VHS, but uh, badly marketed and also up against the Sam Raimi film, which itself didn't do that well and arguably is inferior. Um, no offence to Sam Raimi. At first I thought Stephen had done it. After all his beginnings and endings, he would finally go all the way. He would become a successful color crime movie maker and I'd bring him to class and we would explain how it was done. First thing in making a color crime movie, you need a color crime movie maker. This person here is a color crime movie maker. His name is Steven. He lives in our garage. It's strange, it's deadpan, it's um, lovingly made. It kind of has the level of craft that you'd expect from a Wes Anderson film perhaps. Um, and but it has concerns and kind of uh, thematics that you might see in kind of the same period for David Lynch. So it's really interesting to kind of put it up against something like Blue Velvet, which has the same kind of a similar kind of aesthetic in a way. Um, but then we were able to bring that film um, back uh, to a team up we had with the Glasgow Film Festival, and we were able to show a brand new restoration, and we were able to bring John over. And so, um, to a sold out screening, we brought John, um, everyone loved it, there was kind of rolling laughter, he couldn't quite credit that the audience was reacting so rapturously, so then to bring John out and he was kind of awed by the experience and like, it was just a kind of tragedy really because the film itself and John like should have a much higher status than they do, um, but it was amazing to show that to an audience, to bring John to the audience and to talk about the film and then We've had a good opportunity to bring Crime Wave to different places around the country since then. And um, we're bringing it back for a weird weekend. 